people came and traded. They went to Syria, yeah. Yemen, you know, in the winter and the summer because of this polytheistic idol worship. It was quite, you know, this is one thing. People will come and pay homage and it's a booming business. Doesn't matter which deity you want to worship, you worship and we pay some homage. It was known on this. We are not comparing this to the Silk Route and so on and so forth, but it was relatively well known. And again, it was not that well known enough to take control over this particular piece of land by the Byzantines or the Persians. They left it alone. It wasn't considered to be politically such an important yeah. piece of land that they said, oh, we're going to take over because it's now it's like a strategic point. It wasn't viewed like that. That's why if you look at the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, they did not conquer this particular land. And, and the reason is obvious, because it did not somehow pose a significant economic, military, political threat to those world superpowers of that time. That's how I understand it, right? Please forgive me, yeah? Forgive me. Oh, sorry, yeah. but uh, yeah. because of I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. The board will be... Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But thing. what's important... I asked your friends... Uh, we... They told us... I'm not... I don't know who told us, but they told us... Ibrahim bringing a stone. The, the, the stone of the Mecca. Which time the Ibrahim is coming and in this Mecca, Suri, make the stone and build it? The time. Which time? Which time? Right. Historically speaking, it's very difficult to ascertain because the historical secular narrative isn't as clear as you'd expect. People are still digging within the Arabian Peninsula, whether it is in the, when we're talking about the areas of Sham, the greater Syria, Iraq and so on, including all of Palestine. And people are still digging and coming up with newer things that have been buried for centuries, right? We know that. Like in Israel, for example, discoveries are happening almost every day, you know, every year or something like this. Newer and newer information, archaeological dig is uncovering and unearthing newer information which we didn't know. So secular history doesn't have any evidence yet about a prophet called Moses, for example. There is nothing that I know that points to, in the secular record, that there was a prophet called Moses. But you will see the Christians, the Muslims, the Jewish people, they all believe that he was a historical person. Just because the absence in the secular narrative, it doesn't mean this history and events didn't take place. It's just that our secular narratives our secular narratives are still yet to be found. I can give you one example, a specific example from the Quran. I can relate to that. I went to the city or a village, you can call it, called Tel Marduk or Ebla. This was, and it is in, still in the Syria that we know today, right? You're famous. This place is called Tel Marduk. In Western circles, it is also known as Ebla, E-B-L-A. Now this city, or this particular area, was unknown to secular history, right? It was unknown. So when they excavated and found out, they found clay cuneiform tablets, or clay tablets, talking about the business transactions these people had with other groups or nations, or other, you know, um, communities. And in it mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, Samud, Ad, Iran. There is a chapter in the Quran which talks about Iran. Iramadatil The Iran possesses of like lofty towers and Imad. Many Orientalists, about 200 years ago, roughly around that time, they questioned this thing. Look. The Quran is making a mistake here. There is no city or a place called Iran. It doesn't exist in our historical record. So they made, if you, if you were to study this history, they made a big mess out of it, like how Quran invented, how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, invented these places which doesn't exist in history. When they excavated in Ebla, 
they found these tablets mentioning these cities. From then, this city became part of our historical record. Now we say yes, there was a place called Iran. There was a people called Ad and Samud, for example, right? So we should not question the validity of some of the religious narrative only because the historical narrative are not giving us those records. Because Quran was revealed, as we believe, you know, more than 1400 years ago. And this city of Iran, a place called Iran, only discovered within the last few decades. So you can imagine, our discovery and knowledge had to wait for that long to understand in our narrative of the world history the existence of such and such city. Yeah? So this is something that we have to be very wary and careful when we study history, anthropology and so on. Why? Because many of the things may have gone... I mean, city of Atlantis, people knew about it, but what happened? <laughs> many cities like this goes underground and many things like this, whether people say it's a mythical city and so on. You know the um, narrations that you'll find in some Hindu scriptures talking about the bridge between India and Sri Lanka, Ceylon. They have their stories around it, how Hanuman built a bridge. But actually, now we realize that these waters quite seems quite shallow and there might be something that may have been built and so on. So I am not saying that this miraculous event happened like this, but there could be some element of truth within this historical narratives where people did have some kind of communicative passages from this land, island, to this land. Only with our satellite technology that we have now come to see this. Okay? So we should not just brush away things that we consider from ancient history only as myth and mythology. Because as time goes by with our technology, we may be able to discern the historicity of these events and places and as we are discovering them. Okay? So when it comes to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, we have chronicles by non-Muslim within two years after his death, for example. That's how close the historical narratives about the Prophet is. Compared to other people and other religious figures where we don't have this kind of narratives. So, historically speaking, yes, Prophet Muhammad existed. Mecca, even though you have... Who, what is this name? Um, the one who is making a lot of noise. Um, the English historian. Tom Holland. No? Tom Holland. Yeah. Tom Holland, right? If he only knew the amount of inscriptions that have been now discovered and published, he would have not made these claims, right? That the city didn't exist and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Now we have trade routes, people writing the names of the companions and their students. We're talking about first two, three generations of Muslims. You know, graffitis on the rocks. And scholars don't have doubts of their, you know, the authenticity of the vast majority of them. Because that's how, you know, scholars study paleography and rock inscriptions and come to these conclusions. So, now it has become part of our historical reality that yes, there was a city, there was a dam built by Marwan. There was all these events happening. It's not that Prophet Muhammad lived in a city called Petra and the Kaaba was there. These kind of conspiracy theories are abound. But when you examine their methodology and approach, I actually debated a guy who used to be shout too much here in this park on these theories. And it amounted to using just Google Maps. Come on. If you use Google Maps, you can draw a line anywhere and say that's it. But that's not how maps work. Ancient people had ways of drawing their maps. Ways of aligning a particular directions. You know the astrolabe? Astrolabe. Muslim scientists invented it for a reason. So they can align it to the stars and they can say this is the direction. Yeah, yeah. They can navigate. They navigated through the stars. 
that, when I say they, they named many of the stars, right? We know that. But that's not just bringing Islamic civilization to the tip. They accumulated this knowledge from the Hindus, from the Greeks, yeah. from the Persians, and so on. Knowledge is not one person's business. So, Muslims, from the earlier on, they got the impetus, inspiration from the Quran, which said, Iqra, read. It wasn't believed, the first revelation was Iqra, read. So they realized the importance of gaining knowledge. As they learned, they knew the knowledge was abound in other communities and other civilizations that they left behind. So they gathered what is left from the Greeks, for example, and they started learning the language and translating it. In fact, the world is indebted to the Muslim civilization, Islamic civilization, for preserving the works of the Greek scientists and philosophers when they translated back in, into Arabic, yeah? Because their works were almost lost. So even Charles Darwin, the one who came with the view of evolution, right? He had to, well, he was not the first one. I don't know. He wasn't the first one. There was many people before, from the Muslim side, the Islamic civilization, there was Ikhwan al-Safa. They talked about it. I think even long before that, in some Hindu scriptures, they talk about these kind of things as well. Why you can pinpoint it so some kind of evolution happening, right? It's not a new concept. Charles Darwin had to study Arabic language under his professor Samuel Lee. Why? Because Arabic was the lingua franca in a sense. Gateway to knowledge. This is how Islam made knowledge the foundation of civilization. So the Abbasid, for example, and so on, they used to have houses called Bayt al-Hikmah, the houses of wisdom. And they will sit there and research and study and they will do their amazing learning. People from different works. So in Islamic civilization, it wasn't just Muslims who were contributing. Other peoples of other faith were contributing to this too. Loads of yeah? the Persians, the Persians, we have a lot of indebting to the Persians. A lot of the Persians um, contributed to the intellectual yeah. history of, of so Islam. So, the Renaissance in Europe would not have happened if they did not have contact with the Muslim civilization. Now the scholars are admitting that. Yeah. They did not and they could not admit before because of this, this right. the superiority complex, yeah. where the Europe is the forefront Europe is, was known to be the beacon of civilization at one point. But actually, with, with due respect and humility, Europe was in the Dark Ages, when Islam was in the Golden Ages at that time. So whether it was the University of Cambridge or so on, Oxford, long before this was set up, in the Islamic land, even a woman set up a university, University of Learning and people used to go and learn from them. Whether it was the hospitals and the NHS, you know, we, we in the UK, we benefit from the National Health Service, free health service, right? Where did they get this from? Hundreds of years before, hundreds of years before, Islam already had within its civilization these concepts of Bimaristan or hospital where People will be given treatment, free treatment, or even isolation. I mean, if you were to study this, you would ask this question. What prompted Muslims to develop? What a shame. Nothing else to talk about. Ad hominems, right? Get your own chair, right? Get your own chair, that's the message. So, what prompted the Islamic civilization to be in its peak, golden peak. If you study and you realize it is because of the divine scripture of Islam, the Quran and the prophetic teaching that led people to go and study. The Quran says go and travel inside the earth. See fil ard. People explain that to mean go and travel along the earth. 
But the word is clear, it says, fill our India. And we are doing that today. We are studying within the grounds of our earth and going beneath to study how maybe life originated on this earth or did it come from somewhere else. And various answers go and travel and see how. So the Quran encourages people to learn about history, learn about earlier civilization and what happened to them because of their disobedience and their rejection of God's guidance. So the Quranic message, my friend, is simple. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Worship God alone without any partners and follow the path of Muhammad Take care. Thank <laughs> you. 